Tonight, the FCC chairman on net neutrality, take two. Twitter's stock plunges loads of wearables and is drone footage of tornado damage legal. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 76 for Tuesday, April 29th, 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler has published a new blog post titled Finding the Best Path Forward to Protect the Open Internet. In response to last week's uproar regarding net neutrality, Wheeler addresses many of the concerns about the proposed rules, as well as lack of competition between broadband providers and interconnect deals between streaming services like Netflix and ISPs. Wheeler claims all options are on the table, including reclassifying internet providers so that they can be regulated like phone companies. The FCC goes in front of the House Commerce Subcommittee on Communications on May 20th. Well, Twitter's earnings report did not please the market. Although revenue of $250 million beat expectations, the company's stock fell as much as 11% in after-hours trading. Monthly active users climbed to $255 million, up from $241 million the previous quarter, but analysts were looking for $257 million amidst worries of slowing growth. CEO Dick Costello said on the earnings call that he was really happy with engagement in Q1. Favorites and retweets were up 26% in the quarter, and Costello says that new users are just as engaged as older users. He also pointed to Mopub, Twitter's mobile ad network, that reaches 1 billion users across iOS and Android devices. We'll see how the market looks tomorrow. Apple updated its MacBook Air lineup this morning with updated Intel Haswell processors and price cuts of $100 on all models. The 11 and 13 inch MacBook Air models have been bumped up to a 1.4 gigahertz dual core Intel Core i5 processor with four gigabytes of RAM, and either 128 gigabytes or 256 gigabytes of storage, plus improved battery life. That's a nice bump. Baseline 11 and 13 inch MacBook Airs are priced at $899 and $999 respectively. High end base configura configurations sit at $1,099 and $1,199. All models are available today in retail locations and on Apple's online store with expected shipping availability within 24 hours. But hey, who needs laptops when you can have an iWatch? which we don't have actually at all, but supposedly it's in production, according to sources speaking with the China Times. The wearable is said to take advantage of a manufacturing process called system in package, which is sort of like system on a chip processor, except it's for the entire device. The so-called iWatch could ship about 2.5 to 3 million units in the second quarter of this year, according to supply chain sources, and ship up to 15 million units by the end of Q3 2014. We also heard this last year. We're on a wearables roll now. So at a press conference in New York, Acer showed off the Liquid Leap, a 17 millimeter thick smart band that's both a fitness tracker and a smartwatch. It'll offer text and call notifications. The band may also be bundled with the upcoming Liquid Jade smartphone and should get about five days of use from the band's battery. Acer expects units ship in late July or August. A new wearable ring, yeah, we're not stopping, called Nod is available for pre-order starting today, and it's billing itself as a Bluetooth gesture controller for everything. It supports Mac and Windows desktops, iOS and Android devices, Nest thermostats, Hue lighting systems, even Google Glass. If your device doesn't have Bluetooth, Nod will connect to your smartphone and then connect to that Bluetoothless device via Wi-Fi, so it really works with a lot of stuff. Nod's flat underside has a capacitive touch panel and small buttons, program specific functions for these controls, and then you can use them with your third party apps. Nod acts like a cursor and responds to gestures, movements, and physical commands. So if it sounds like your kind of ring, that will be $149, please, and it should ship this fall. Now, Amazon hasn't launched its own wearable device yet, but it did just launch a web storefront dedicated to smartwatches, activity cameras, wearables, and other technology in that same category. The store includes products from Samsung, GoPro, Jawbone, the big guys, and smaller emerging brands, including Misfit and Narrative. No Google Glass, though. Not a big surprise there. 
The information is reporting that Google does have a so-called Silver program in the works, reported originally in early April by Android Police. Silver is about gaining more control over the Android ecosystem and building a Nexus-style program with the potential to reach a wider number of the buy-in public through incentive-driven partnerships with carriers and OEMs. The information reports that incentives include indirect payments with up to one billion in spending on promoting silver devices through ad campaigns and in-store displays and kiosks with employees that are trained by Google. Silver devices will also get more timely Android updates like Nexus hardware. Coming up, MIT students want to hand out Bitcoins to all. But first, I am joined by Eric Mack, contributor over at CNET, Forbes, and Gizmag. Hey, Eric. How you doing? I've got my wearable, so so we're good to go. Yeah, which one is that? It's, a, I think, a Wii Things or Wii Things. I don't know how you pronounce it. The O2 one that uh, yeah. measures your blood oxygen level. So far, so good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And it's a very nice shade of purple. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Enough about wearables. I don't know. Maybe people will be wearing drones eventually. You have an article on CNET. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating, really. Get a drone's eye view of Arkansas tornado aftermath. Now, this is footage shot from a drone, and it's really quite soon after a tornado actually touched down in Mayflower, Arkansas. You can see extensive damage. Cameraman and a storm chaser shot it. We can see emergency vehicles. Rescues look to be underway. You can see you know, people look like they're moving around with flashlights and debris. Who shot this? So this was actually shot by a storm chaser and photographer out of Arkansas. Uh, I believe his name is Brian M. Finger. I, I might have that wrong, but I think that's what it was. Uh, and yeah, it's really amazing stuff because, you know, he's just flying a, a small drone with, I believe, five inch propellers. Uh, with a video camera strapped to it, but it can get so close, so much closer than you would get with like your basic news station uh, helicopter. Uh, and, and yeah, like you said, right there, you can you can see the the actual flashlights. You can see the people uh, digging through the rubble, and you can get all sorts of different vantage points. Whereas normally, you just have a news helicopter that's much higher up with kind of one angle that it can offer. So the FAA is investigating this, though. Why is that? So the deal with drones right now is that they're still working out the regulations, the FAA is. And so at the moment, commercial drone use is prohibited. And that apparently uh, the FAA's definition includes reporting as a commercial use. So yeah, there was a report out of Arkansas today that uh, the FAA is now invest investigating this particular case. And it's not the first time, actually, that you know some fairly harmless uses of drones uh, drones have been slapped by the FAA. There was a company out of Wisconsin uh, that did just kind of a goofy commercial where they they took a, a six pack of beer and they delivered it via drone out to some folks ice fishing on a frozen lake in Wisconsin. And the FAA didn't like that either. Well, so what happens to these photographers? Let's say that the FAA uh, considers this uh, illegal, not not they weren't supposed to do it. What happens? Uh, so in this particular case, it could be up to a ten thousand dollar fine which obviously could lead to, you know, some some court cases. Um, and, you know, it, who knows? I, you know, we have a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong First Amendment here. So I'd like to think that uh, if if it went to that, that uh, courts would find in favor, at least of the reporting use. I don't know about the beer drone thing so much. And, right. and uh, you know, I've actually considered uh, uses of drones myself and decided against it. Uh, for, for torture testing devices for, you know, some stories that we run on CNET. I wanted to take a drone and, and strap a uh, one of those indestructible type smartphones to it and actually drop it off. We have the Rio Grande Gorge here that's a thousand feet deep. So I was hoping to be able to fly a drone over the gorge and then drop a phone a thousand feet into the river and see how it does. But then kind of decided against that for legal reasons and, you know, didn't want to give a kayak or a concussion or anything. So. I, 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 I would have to think if, if legal battles started opening up because of these types of situations, maybe there could be exceptions during disaster areas if, if something was declared a state of emergency. What do you think? I mean, I would think so. I mean, what's pretty crazy with the way that the rules are set up right now, and the FAA will say, well, we're working on it. You know, there will be more comprehensive rules coming out in the coming years. But the way it's set up right now is that, you know, personal drone use is fine. So I can take a drone out to the park and then maybe fly it over uh, over the neighbor's yard and like actually spy on my neighbor a little bit. And I'm not going to get slapped on the wrist for that, most likely. Uh, but, you know, to use a, a drone in the public interest in like a da disaster scenario like this, like you're talking about, well, that's a, a gray area that you could get fined for. You know, and it just seems to me to be another case of, you know, the law lacking behind the tech. 
And then there's also the commerce angle. Amazon has talked about using delivery drones. You know, some people laugh about that, but I don't, th I don't think the company's kidding. I think they'd love to do that. That's, that's a whole other thing because we're talking about corporations making money from this. Right. Well, that's, you know, the, that's the commercial use that I think we're, we're really, the FAA is really concerned about. Uh, and, and, you know, I have to think that those delivery drones specifically that Amazon's talking about are probably a little further off than they would have us believe. I mean, there's a maze of federal and state and local laws that they're going to have to deal with. And I tell you what, if you think that there's been a backlash or, uh, around the few thousand people walking around with Google Glass, just wait until the public is faced with the possibility of delivery drones in their cities and on every block. I think that might take some getting used to. And I think it's cases like this one that we're seeing now involving journalists and other similar ones that will give us the first sense of uh, how society feels about more drones in our future. Well, Eric Mack, contributor over at CNET, Forbes, and Gizmag, kind of fast, really fascinating video. Uh, we'll have that definitely on our website if you want to check it out again. Uh, but thank you, Eric, uh, for joining us on Tech News Tonight. Where can people catch up with more of your work? Well, yeah, I, I contribute to the Crave blog over at uh, CNET and also to Forbes. And uh, I'm going to be uh, heading out your direction uh, next month for Maker Fair for Gizmag. So also check that out. And I'm Eric C. Mack on Twitter. Oh, good to look for some Twit folks because we'll be there too. All right, cool. All well, right. Have a good one. Thank you, Sarah. All right, see you later. Finally, two MIT students, Jeremy Rubin and Dan Elitzer, have successfully raised more than half a million dollars in order to give all 4,528 undergraduate students on campus $100 worth of Bitcoin each. The two say that the intention is to establish a genuine ecosystem for digital currencies at the university. The cash has been raised from around 25 donors, according to MIT publication The Tech, although about half of that figure will reportedly come from Alexander Morcos, co-founder of Hudson River Trading. The aim of the project is to study how Bitcoins are used by students and, supposedly, there will be no limitations on what students can do with them. Silk Road 3, anybody? Just kidding. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss our morning news show, Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.